Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the, the Lord, Lord, the Most High, is awesome. A great king over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout to the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises to God. Our sing, king, our sing, king sing praises. praises. Welcome to Worship Creston Church. We've been praying for you as you gather for worship in all of your various watching and listening places. We pray that each one of you will have an encounter with the living God. The good news for us today is that the living God is right here and he's right there wherever you are. If this is the first time that you've joined us, welcome. You can find out more about our church by going to our website CrestonChurch.org. Feel free to send an email if you'd like us to get in touch with you. I've had some printer trouble today, so you'll notice that I'm using my phone today to read my notes. I'm praying that this different, different appearance will not be a distraction to you. Today, we come to the end of our consideration of the latter portion of the book of Genesis. These texts provide the accounts of the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We hope that these portions of God's word will have been encouraging to you as you make your journey through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, on the first Sunday of the month, we have the privilege of gathering around the table to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. May God give you his rich blessing as you partake of this very special meal. You'll want to make sure that your prepared bread and cup are nearby for later on in today's worship service. You can find the order of worship in today's email. It contains everything you'll need to partici participate fully in our worship service, including the Lord's Supper. And now as we continue our worship, I invite you to stretch out your hands as a visible sign of receiving God's greeting right along with everyone else who is watching and listening today. My friends, our Lord has called us to worship and now he greets us. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of the kings on earth. And all God's people said, together, Amen.
Good morning, Creston family. Let us pray. In the midst of this season, we are more divided than ever. These divisions in our country seep into our communities, our neighborhoods. When the world seeks division, let us sow unity. May you guide each of us today and the coming days with the openness to see you in each other. When the threat of violence looms in our nation from positions of power and shown on our streets, we cry out to you, Yahweh Shalom, God of peace. With so much hate, intolerance, and prejudice being shown in our nation, Lord, let us turn to you and give way to love, the deep kind of love you have taught us to live into. We need this love, your love, more than ever, it seems. Let us not stray into the neighborhood of despair, for they are hopes, they are real, they exist, and the ultimate hope we have is in you. Let us not go into the direction of darkness and continually remind us, Lord, that the sun exists. We thank you for such reminders of hope you have so freely lavished on your people. Humble God, we have become quick to alienate and even demonize those who do not walk with us in our way. Our debates and theologies have been infiltrated by hubris. We believe that our task is to get others to think and do like us. Humble us. Open our eyes to the wisdom of the people in our community, the immigrants and the marginalized. Broaden our horizons to see your hands and feet at work across the nation and across the world. From the mouth of the stranger, teach us.
Shout and be glad, daughter of Zion, for I am coming, and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Geweldig nah, hoe zoet geleid, dat redden zon, daar mij. Ik was verloren, gewonden nu, hoe maakt mij zind en Worship also includes our offerings. As we have been just reminded again of God's grace toward us, our best response is to offer our whole lives back to God. Offering money is just one very special part of doing that. During these times of being apart, you may give your gifts using the postal system or our online giving process, making sure to clearly designate which causes you'd like your offering to be shared with. Deacons are pleased to acknowledge your faithful and continued giving to the ministries of Creston Church. They also encourage you to consider our special offerings that are listed in the Friday email. Today's special offering is for the Benevolence Fund, a fund that's managed by our deacons to provide help to those in need in our church and in our community. Our weekly offering is for the other ministries of our church and our denomination. What God has called us to do as a church in this neighborhood and city and what God has called us to do as a denomination all around the world. May God bless you in your giving. Please remember to check that Friday email. It contains lots of information for you about our church family and about the ongoing ministries of Creston Church. The most recent edition includes information about the efforts of the Pastor Search Committee. The Creston Coat Collection, we could call that CCC, and the resources that are available to Creston Church, 
members from Pine Rest, as well as the various activities and resources for our children and youth. Even though we're quite limited in our comings and goings, there are very many very special ways for you to serve God and our community. May God bless you. I'd like to share the prayer concerns that we've received recently. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Julie gives thanks for the encouragement and prayer after her recent prayer request for the tendonitis in her hands. Her right hand is starting to improve post-surgery regarding movement and pain, and she has a clearer idea of the next steps to take for them to fully heal. Julie thanks us for praying for her as the family of God at Creston Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. While it was with disappointment that Megan and her fiance Matt had to call off their larger Michigan wedding due to COVID-19, they're still grateful to have celebrated their marriage commitment a week ago with a smaller family wedding in Pittsburgh. They would have loved to celebrate with Creston Church, but still greatly appreciate our prayers as they begin this new season of life together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. My mom, Ruth, passed away a week ago. I was able to be with her for th her last three days and was grateful to be on the journey with her. Please pray for me and our family as we continue to grieve her absence from us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dana and Lance and their family, thank you for the many prayers for baby Reuben. While still in the NICU, he is off the ventilator, breathing on his own, and his vitals have stabilized. They continue to pray for a full healing of his brain, as they're still not sure of the extent of the damage. He has shown signs of healing, though, and they praise God for that. Continue to pray for his brain, particularly that he would learn how to swallow on his own. And pray for his parents, who have varying levels of strength each day and who also have a two-year-old at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. If we're willing to pay attention, we can see God at work in our lives in so many ways. Be sure to share God's story by sending an email or a video of your special experiences. Here's a God story from me. You, dear friends of Creston, kindly sent these pictures, I hope that you can see them, to the funeral home in memory of my mom. They're beautiful. As is often done, my sisters and I developed a plan to share the various plants and flowers between us. Another tradition is to place some of those flowers at the church of the person who has died. So these flowers that hopefully you are looking at right now are on display today, right along with us, at my mom's church, where they have begun a limited phase of gathering in person in for worship. You might wonder, what church is it? It's one of Creston's neighbor congregations, East Leonard Christian Reformed Church. Our two congregations have often shared in joint ministry opportunities. I thought it would be a beautiful thing to share the flowers from you, Creston Church, with our brothers and sisters at my mom's church, East Leonard Church. God has a way of creating wonderful opportunities to experience his love and his care in surprising and unique ways. Now please join me in our prayers of the people. Merciful God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us day after day. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, 
knowing that you will hear and respond. We pray for those who are estranged from spouse or family, friends or neighbors, who find it difficult to forgive past wrongs done to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who for years have carried feelings of guilt or regret for something they did or something they neglected to do, who find it difficult to ask for forgiveness or forgive themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who find themselves far away from you, struggling to overcome their doubts or delusionment, and who wonder how to find their way back, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those watching someone they love try to cope with serious illness or injury, and who long for your miraculous intervention, including baby Reuven and Julie, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the many others in our world who are suffering this day from grief or loneliness, hunger, poverty, violence, or illness, including my own family, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all those who look to you in hope, including newlyweds Megan and Matt, and strengthen us, your people, so that we may be a light to all those who find themselves in darkness. In the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, amen. Our children have the opportunity to join in on their own regular video time of children's worship. We pray for God's blessings upon you. Let's all say this blessing together. The Lord be with you and also with you. At this time in our worship service, we have the privilege of reading a portion of God's Word and giving some consideration to it. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, first book of the Bible. And we're, we are going to read the first 15 verses of Genesis chapter 45. And before we read, let's pray together. Eternal God, in the reading of the scriptures, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brother, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in that land, in this land, and for the next five years there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there 
because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it really is I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Clarence Crane was a chocolate candy maker from Ohio. In 1912, he faced up to the fact that his chocolate sales were very poor during the summertime because the chocolate melted in that era of very little air conditioning. No one wanted to purchase melted chocolate. He saw a machine that pharmacies used to make pills that were round and wafer shaped and thought he'd use that to make those mints. The machinery could also punch a hole in the center and Crane named the candy after its resulting life preserver shape. The rest is history and recorded on Wikipedia. I have fond memories of lifesavers as our standard church candy when I was growing up. Today we're going to give some thought to another lifesaver, this time in the form of a person sent by God, a God-sent lifesaver. The last time we saw Joseph, he had just been sold as a slave by his brothers. His hands are tied and the caravan heads on down to the south, down that trade route to Egypt. Joseph's brothers are thrilled to have gotten rid of this favorite son of their dad. Now perhaps they might receive a little bit more love from Jacob. We don't read any more about these brothers until 20 years or so later. Meanwhile, the book of Genesis keeps close tabs on Joseph. A high-ranking Egyptian official purchases Joseph. His master, Potiphar, is impressed with Joseph and gives him more and more responsibilities. There's an unfortunate misunderstanding about Joseph's behavior toward Potiphar's wife and Joseph lands in prison. But Joseph perseveres in his good behavior and offers the interpretation of some dreams of the prisoners. When Joseph provides dream interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, this beloved son of Jacob becomes the leading prince of all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. Joseph's chief responsibility is to prepare the nation for the dream predicted seven year famine that is now crippling the entire Middle East, including the land of Canaan, where Jacob and his sons continue in their huge livestock operation. Two years into the famine, Genesis 42 verse one and two records the situation of Jacob and his clan. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. The next three chapters are filled with the details of journeys of the brothers, Joseph's recognition of them, even though they don't recognize him, and Joseph's continued curious treatment of his brothers. Jacob, his family, and everyone else in that part of the world were desperate for grain. Jacob begs his, son to do, his sons to do something, to go to Egypt, where he's heard that there is grain. Above all, Jacob is desperate that he and his family will live through this terrible famine and escape death. 
Jacob's sons are desperate too, and they make multiple offers to Joseph in trying to make a deal with him. They even agree to bring Jacob's youngest son, Benjamin, another one of Joseph's demands. They're desperate to live. Their hope is that the grain in Egypt will be their lifesaver. They've done everything that they could to stay in the good graces of this prince of Egypt in order to get that grain and head back to Canaan. Jacob and his sons are not the only people who become desperate in the middle of the challenges of life. We'd love to have everything go nicely for ourselves and for our loved ones, but that's certainly not the case for any of us. We often become desperate for life to become straightened out, for our troubles to be eased. Every day, our news sources bombard us with news reports of hatred and mistreatment because of the racism that infects our culture and, yes, even our own hearts here at Creston Church. Some of us, along with others who are our neighbors, are desperate to receive honorable treatment that has nothing to do with colors of skin or ethnic backgrounds. Desperate to be able to live without fear and instead to live in safety. Others of us are desperate to be rid of COVID-19 and the many hardships that the pandemic has brought to our lives. Some of us yearn for healing from our sickness or that of our loved ones and friends. More of us find ourselves grieving the death of our loved ones. And still others are desperate for the lifting of all sorts of discouragement that comes our way every single day. It's not too difficult to swap out Jacob's name and Jacob's desperation for grain with our own grasping at ways to discover hope-filled living. We're looking for some sort of lifesaver that can make some improvements in our lives. It doesn't take very much analysis of our lives to discover that our biggest source of desperation is what to do about that sin that makes a wreck of our lives and fills us with guilt and shame. When we read the entire message of the Bible, we discover that without intervention, our sin will result in eternal death. Some sort of lifesaver is definitely needed. Back in Egypt, finally, after multiple encounters with his brothers and listening to them talk about his dad and their willingness to protect Benjamin, Joseph can't take it anymore. It's time to do the big reveal. This grown man, this prince of Egypt, fills the hall with the sound of his weeping. I am Joseph! Dead silence is the companion to their terror. I am Joseph! How is my father? more terror. Don't be afraid. You don't need to be angry with yourselves. And then this, God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you. It was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times, God sent me. Not only is Joseph God sent, but he is the lifesaver of his brothers and of the entire region because it was to save lives, to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives. Throughout this series of the book of Genesis, we keep going back to those seven promises that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth through you will be blessed through you. Once more, we see God at work, a little bit more, in order to keep his promises, 
God keeps on keeping this clan of Abraham alive, even in the middle of a worldwide famine. Those brothers have no idea how these promises will continue to be worked out. All they know about is what's happening today and the joy that this reunion is going to bring their old father Jacob when they bring him the good news that Joseph is their God-sent lifesaver. God sent him ahead to Egypt in order that their lives would be saved. Nowhere in this text will we find the word sovereignty. However, that's exactly what's going on here. Sometimes it's easier for us to understand these big concepts in the middle of a story. This story about Joseph being the God-sent lifesaver. Walter Brueggemann shares some broad summary thoughts about God's sovereignty, his kingly rule, in his commentary. These thoughts, God's purposes, are ultimately the final word. God's purposes create a real and true newness or beginning. God's purposes are utterly and completely gracious. God's purposes are hidden and mysterious, such that a story is often the only way we can discover his sovereignty. God's purposes are worked out in the concrete events of history. As we listen to Joseph in verses 5 through 8, we hear him declare his faith in a God who is in charge, while at the same time he chooses to work through the actions of human beings. As Gordon Wenham writes, though Genesis emphatically states that God uses the sins of Joseph's brothers for good, it nowhere excuses their sins or pretends that they can be forgotten. Rather, they needed to be acknowledged and repented of. Again, he writes, the relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility is a theological mystery that is something ultimately beyond human comprehension. This is why we'll be singing God Moves in a Mysterious Way in just a short time. No wonder Joseph weeps, weeps, and weeps again at this God-ordained reunion with his brothers. Joseph is the God-sent lifesaver. It doesn't take too much effort to discover that the Bible tells about another God-sent lifesaver. The Apostle John fills his gospel with these sorts of thoughts. For example, he writes in chapter 6, verse 57, that Jesus says, Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus is the Father's God-sent lifesaver. When we feed on or take action on the words of Jesus, we will live forever. For the loving beauty of these words from John 17, verse 23, I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The love of the Father for his Son Jesus is the same love that the Father has for us. Ultimately, from John chapter 6, verse 29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. When we believe in the forgiveness of Jesus, the God-sent lifesaver, Salvation is ours forever. Our sinful salvation, sinful situation is redefined. God's grace covers over that sin. Our lives have been saved for all time. For most of us, this is not a brand, this is not brand new news. We've heard this old, old story over and over again. 
It's not a boring old, old story, however. It's a story that we love to repeat over and over. Jesus is our God-sent lifesaver. Over and over, we come to the table to tell and claim the same truth. Jesus is our God-sent lifesaver. Over and over again, God soothes our soul with the same bread and cup. This is my son, the one I sent to you to be your lifesaver. As we celebrate that life, we also take comfort in knowing that he encourages us at the table for all of our everyday troubles too. Racism, pandemics, sickness, sorrow, and discouragement. Jesus has experienced all of them. And at the table, he gives us hope and strength for each day and offers eternal hope on top of everything else. So my friends, take hold of our God-sent lifesaver. Trust him with your very life. Celebrate the Savior who gave his own life so that we could have life and have it to the full forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Eternal God, you are present with us throughout our lives, even when others plot to do us harm. We are so grateful. Help us to trust in your big plan for all creation, and in your loving plan for the saving of our souls. To you, Jesus, our God-sent lifesaver, we give our thanks and praise. Amen. God has just fed us from his word, and now we have the privilege to be nourished at his table for the Lord's Supper. You'll want to have your order of service available, as well as your prepared bread and cup. So let's begin. The Gospels tell us that on the first day of the week, the day on which our Lord arose from the dead, he appeared to some of his disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Come then to the joyful feast of our Lord. People of God, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. Let's pray. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his glorious resurrection overcame the power of sin and gave us new life. 
Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation <clears throat> to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart pours out my praise to you. You are holy, Lord. <clears throat> we give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> in the same way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat the bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <clears throat> Let us therefore join with the church of all times and all places and profess our faith in our triune God as signed and sealed in this sacrament using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we approach your table, we ask that you move among us through your word and spirit. Bring resurrection where there is death, hope where there is depression, light where there is darkness. And may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ draw us closer to you and closer to one another until your kingdom comes in all of its fullness. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The elders of Creston Church have given their supervision for the preparation of the Lord's Supper prior to our service, and they are joining with all of us for this gracious meal in their own safe places. Now it's time for all of you to make sure that the bread and drink that you have prepared is nearby for everyone that is participating. Enough pieces on a plate for each person in your location and enough cups with a small amount poured out for each person. I'll prompt you in just a few moments when it's time to eat and drink. <clears throat> for those of you who are choosing not to take the communion elements today, let me offer this special blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All of you who are sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord, are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord to receive these gifts of God for you and me, the people of God. You may distribute the bread to each person. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to Christ and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in Christ and you will not thirst. Take the bread, eat it. Remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. You may distribute the cups to each person. Taste and see, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, taste and see, taste and see the goodness of the Lord, of the Lord. Take, drink it. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Please join me in celebration with these words from Psalm 103 that are in your order of service. You may say those phrases right along with me. Together we say, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for feeding us in this sacrament, uniting us with Christ, and giving us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out now in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, my friends, we've come to the end of our time of worship together. I invite you to sit up a little straighter in your chair, perhaps stand in body or in spirit, and re receive God's parting blessing. May you, people of God, know that God our Father made you and guides your every step. Jesus Christ gave his life for you and brings you new life. The Spirit keeps you in the Lord's presence and empowers you to serve. May Almighty God continue to bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.